to basically define what an emissions vector is. Uh, first of all, and then we'll get into some examples here. Uh, unlike an absorption spectrum, where in that case it's an otherwise continuous spectrum except for specific gaps, in the case of an emission spectrum, it's exactly the opposite. It is a lack of light with a couple anti-gaps or, or, or a couple regions where there accidentally is a little bit of light. So basically, it is a, um, a, a light that is given off at only very certain discrete wavelengths and no light given off at anything in between. And the easier way to see it is just to show a couple examples. And the way that we can, we can actually kind of achieve this in a lab setting, and I'll, I'll briefly explain this as well, um, how to create, because these, these are pretty well known on Earth, uh, just in a spectroscopy lab, for example. So all you do is you take a chamber, an enclosed chamber of some sort of gas, and let's just consider, let's say, argon gas, and you attach one side to a positive terminal, you attach one side to a negative, and when you ramp up the voltage between them enough, all of a sudden you start getting out light of a variety of different wavelengths. So the short, the long and the short of it is, in order to create an emission, yeah, to create an emission spectra of a certain element, you electrify it. And, and in, a, in a, the, the best possible case, you is isolate only that element, so you make a vacuum tube filled with only that you know, gas that you're exploring or whatever. So you can do that, and what you find, if you take a, a, a tube of, for example, strictly hydrogen gas, we're talking um, just hydrogen atoms in this case, individual atomic hydrogen. Now that's different than what we'd consider as the, the molecular hydrogen, or H2, which we might be breathing in tiny amounts. Um, so this is just simply atomic hydrogen, which is individual H atoms moving around on their own. So this is what you would get. In the visible range of, of the spectrum, you get uh, starting at very short wavelengths, which our eyes perceive as purple or, or violet, you get what looks like a couple different, and it's a little bit tough to see on the screen here, but a, a couple wavelengths of, of varying degrees of like dark navy or dark violet or light violet or blue or whatever. Um, by the way, the, the whole Roy G. Biv spectrum, uh, what the hell is indigo? I, I, I've never yet figured that out. Um, so it's Roy G. Biv to me. Uh, it goes from blue to violet. Anyway, uh, now we see one very specific teal wavelength. And this is important, and that's the one that, that I believe I had referenced at 497 nanometers. And then if you look way over here in the very red part of the spectrum, that's probably the single most important emission line in all of astronomy. This is the line that, or this is the, the wavelength that we see. And um, like, if you just take any normal, like full color camera, you put it in a telescope, take a, you know, scan the sky. I guarantee you in about one of like, let's say three or four frames, you're going to get definite light emission at that exact wavelength, 656 nanometers. And that's a telltale sign that you have hydrogen gas that is being heated up somehow or another. And turns out, whenever you see light at exactly that wavelength, 666.29 something something, so we measure this extremely precisely, that you can be quite confident that you're viewing hydrogen that is being electrified or heated up. So, moving on to helium. Same thing happens, we fill a tube with helium, and the helium will produce a, a more complicated light spectrum. And you see now there's some doublets. Uh, it looks like in the teal, there, there's a couple that are closer together. Some blue doublets. There's a very distinct, very bright yellowish line. And now when, you're, when your eyes are used to seeing helium, like you typically think orange, and really what you're seeing is your eyes, the, the red and the green and the blue cones of your eyes, are finding some average value based on all of those different like colors of light hitting your eyes simultaneously. And your eye's response to that, that it, that it signals to your brain is, hey, I'm seeing quite a bit of yellowish red and some other like blue. I'm going to say orange to, to the back of my brain or whatever. And that's what the, that, that's why you perceive neon light to be typically like bright orange. Now, um, uh, there's various reasons why like a neon sign might be, might be blue or, you know, green or something like that. And typically it's, you're blocking those dominant wavelengths. You're, you're painting the tube to disallow those red or, or uh, yellow wavelengths that would allow us to be coming through. Uh, or at least that's my understanding of it. 
Um, so, but it looks like a more complicated spectrum. And again, if you just chose a random wavelength between what we're seeing is between about 350 to about 750 nanometers there. That's the typical visible effect of 400 to 750. Um, so in that, in that range there, if you just choose an arbitrary wavelength of just arbitrary nanometers, let's say, you know, 518 nanometers, there's a very tiny chance that you had just accidentally chosen one of those, you know, few spectra, because these spectra lines, these, these little, you know, anti-gaps, if you will, are incredibly narrow, that you, that if you don't choose a number between 656.2 and 656.8, you're not going to see any of that light. So, so that's why, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's the opposite of an absorption spectrum. And that's why when you learn how to analyze these emission spectra here on Earth, which is what we have a better grasp on, then when you relate them back to the absorption spectra that we just talked about, then you can apply our knowledge to understand one by understanding the other. So, a um, couple more here, and then I want to play a, um, well, I'll explain what it is. So, let's see. Uh, so, you know, I think I was just explaining, when I was talking about helium, I was explaining what neon would look like. Uh, this is neon. When you look at a neon sign, I don't know why I was thinking we have helium signs. Um, <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, when you look at a neon sign, it looks very orange-red because of all these orange-red emission lines here. Uh, so I don't know what I was talking about there. But, um, so we see as we get more and more, if you, if you think about the periodic table now, though, as we're going down further in the periodic table, we see more and more of these different lines of, of specific energies of light we're emitting. I think I included, yeah, one more, argon gas. And so the reason why I usually do this is in an actual lab setting, um, we actually do have at school a, it's all, almost like a little kind of carousel thing of different little small lamps of each of these elements and, and some more. Uh, we have like CO2, we have some, um, we have some kryptonite, and no, I'm joking about that. Um, but we have various different elements that, that as you spin the tube around, if you like otherwise like completely darken all the lights, and uh, you, we have a classroom set of these little spectroscope, like spectroscopic glasses, basically, that um, that you spreads light out in the same way that a prism does. You can actually literally identify, uh, base if, if you didn't otherwise know. If I, for example, showed a tube that just had these exact emission lines, you can immediately know, hey, that's hydrogen, and it's like eighty-five percent of the class gets it the first time. If I show something complicated like this on about the second try, everyone gets neon because you know immediately what neon uh, looks like. And that's what spectroscopy is. That's what arguably one of the most important like contributions to the history of astrophysics or, or science in general is literally looking at these different spectral lines and figuring out what the universe is made of.